time. My dad was something to do with the telephone company there, but we went home to mother to have me. So, so that's how I happened to be born there. And uh, my dad uh, was transferred from Sweetwater to Morristown when I was two. And I started in the first grade there. Uh, that school now is Rose School and it's a museum. Okay. <laughs> I seem to end up in museums. Museum. Right. <laughs> and and we left there when I was 10, and Dad became manager of the Maryville Alcoa uh, Exchange. And, then, and so that's where I really became interested in education, because I had a wonderful uh, teacher, um, Lamar Alexander's father. I'm, I've heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought you probably had. And then uh, Maryville College was there, and my sister um, finished high school there, and she went to Maryville College. And we moved away from there when I was, uh, we, Dad became manager of uh, Etowah, Athens, and that whole area. And we were there two years. I was in high school then. And then they transferred him back to Morristown because they made that a district office, so he became plant manager. And I went back there, so that's, I graduated from Morristown High School and then went on to Maryville College. I didn't want to go to college. All right. My parents insisted that I go, and every, at the end of every semester, I'd pack up and come home and say, I'm not going back, and they'd pack me up and send me back. So uh, about the second end of the second year, my dad said, what are you majoring in? And I said, I don't know, I just want to quit. <laughs> And he said, well, you better, you better uh, get certified to teach because if you're a teacher, you can always find a job. Mm -hmm. So I opened the catalog to see what I could major in, and it landed on drama. So I okay. majored in drama okay. <laughs> with a co-major in English. And I, when I graduated, I could e teach high school English. And I, uh, my roommate and another uh, gal that we were in school with and I decided to go to Norfolk County, Virginia to teach because they came recruiting and of course we thought of all those sailors that were in Norfolk oh, County and <laughs> we thought we'd get a, an apartment and we'd all have a great time. Well when we got there they were placed way on the other side of Norfolk County and they were elementary teachers and I was placed at Craddock High School and I was way on the other side. So I hardly saw those girls all that year. I really did like teaching, but I didn't know what to do. I really, I didn't know anything about teaching reading. And most of the kids that I had were, uh, were kids of, of um, Navy, from the Navy yards. Mm -hmm. and, and so I didn't, you know, I didn't know what to do with them. What year was that? That was 1950. <clears throat> And so I packed up and came home at the end of the year. Though I had fun with them, I really enjoyed them. And, and what I did, I did fine. I directed the plays and coached the debate team and then had, I worked all the time. And I came home and said, I'll starve to death before I'll teach school again. So I got a job in Morristown as a secretary in one of those factories up there, mm -hmm. Cedar Jesse. That was the most miserable eight months of my entire life. Okay. I hated going to work. And so my best friend was Ruth James, who later became Ruth Wigington. She taught at Carnes High School for a number of years. And her father was the superintendent of schools in Hamlin County. And one day he said to me, Ruth Ellen, you shouldn't be working at that factory. You should be teaching school. And I said, but I don't know how to teach. And he said, well, come on, I'll hire you in the sixth grade. We'll get you a temporary certificate, and you can learn how to teach by reading those teacher's manuals. Okay. <laughs> well, fortunately, that uh, I was hired to teach. I ended up with a split fifth and sixth grade, and I had a very uh, nice principal who just left me alone. <laughs> as long as I kept them quiet, reasonably quiet, I was okay. But the weekend that school started, a, a team from the Benny and Smith Company, which makes Crayola crayons, right. 
came and did a workshop Friday, all day Friday. I guess it was Friday afternoon, all day Saturday, and all day Sunday. And the whole thing was how to teach with various kinds of art things. That saved my life. Right. Of course, I spent nearly all my salary <laughs> on, on art things because we had no money, you know, for, for any kind of, of stuff to, to work with. But we had a great time. In fact, about 10 years ago, I guess, I was visiting my parents in Morristown, and I was in, walking through one of the... Uh, the mall, or the mall in Morristown, and so met these two very mature women toward, coming toward me. And when they passed, I heard one of them say, I think that is her. And the other woman said, do you really think so? And I turned around and I said, who do you think I am? <laughs> and, and, and the woman said, the Battle of Hastings, Battle of Hastings, 1066. <laughs> Oh my goodness, is what a terrible thing to be remembered by. Okay. <laughs> she said, I said, what did I do that made you remember that? And she said, don't you remember how we made these soldiers out of paper mache and we fought the Battle of Hastings? Okay. <laughs> you put a big chart on the wall and every time we beat, you know, won a battle, why you put it up on the wall? She said, I'll never forget the Battle of Hastings. <laughs> But, you know, yeah. that shows you how important it is to yeah. do things with kids when you're yeah. teaching them Absolutely. that gets them involved. And I didn't know any better to, than to do that, but yeah. I learned all that from the Benny and Smith Company. I think I ought to write them a letter sometime and tell them about right. it. Anyway, I, it was, that was the year that made a teacher out of me because I really enjoyed working with those kids. But I had the 10, uh, 12, I guess, of the best fifth graders and I had, let's see, I had 38. So the rest of them were the lower sixth graders, right. and they were picked that way, right. assuming that they'd be about on the same level. Right. Well, never no, works. That, no, never works, never works. So the fifth graders helped me teach the sixth graders. Okay. <laughs> but it, it was a good year for me. And um, so Charlie Ross was the principal of Rose School where I had started out in first grade. And his brother-in-law and I started out in first grade together, and he was teaching in, in uh, Morristown, and I guess he was principal of elementary school. At, no, he, Sonny Evans was his name. He was teaching at the junior high. And he said, why don't you come on into the city system? Charlie's looking for a sixth grade teacher for Rose School, and he's a good principal. I didn't know Charlie, but I knew his, his wife. Mm -hmm. So I started teaching in the school, and I started out in the first grade. Okay. And I taught there two years and had a great time because I, the other sixth grade teacher and I worked together. And we did a lot of artwork, and she was a musician. She played the piano, and we had an operetta. I directed the drama, okay. and she did the music. It was great. And so then Charlie uh, was promoted, quotes, I always hate that, to the high school. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, why don't you come, you've learned how to teach reading now, why don't you come on and teach uh, high school English again? So I did, and I taught high school English in Morristown High for four years. Okay. But I never really felt that I knew how to teach reading to high school kids. A lot of it I just learned by, I don't know, guesswork. In fact, you may have heard of the language experience approach. Right. Well, yeah. I did that with a lot of those kids. Mm -hmm. They'd yeah. come in, you know, all excited about the football game. And I would say, well, let's see. What do you, why, why are you so excited about this? And I'd write the things they said on the board. Mm -hmm. and, and it was so funny the first time I did that because I saw one of the boys lean over. Yeah, I did say that. You know, it, they, it began to make sense to, and so that's that's how mostly I taught those those high school boys, who uh, just never had. Well, they just they never tried really to learn to read. But but I, I really had a good time doing that, and I directed the plays. My last uh, year, my fourth year there, um, I do the I did the senior play, and we did our town. 
And I have seen it many times since then, and I'll declare to you, none of them have ever been as good as the one, one we did. Yeah, <laughs> it was great. That. Yeah, it was really great. And that class that I started with in the ninth grade, and then I was there, one of their sponsors, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, had their fiftieth reunion this last summer, and they invited me to come. And it was wonderful. I, I just imagine. had the biggest time with those kids, really. I couldn't yeah. believe, I had never, I had only seen, you know, one or two of them in the 50 years because I, I just, you know, a lot of them have left Morristown, but a lot of them came back for that and it was really fun. Well, back to, back to uh, my career. Are you sure you want to hear all this? <laughs> I don't know why not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> at the end of the fourth year at, at the high school, I graduated with that class and came to UT to get my master's degree. All right. And by that time, I had decided that the whole problem with kids learning to read had to do with the library. So I decided I was going to become a librarian because when I taught in high school, I had all my windows were full of paperback books that mm -hmm. I'd gotten through mainly Teenage Book Club. Mm -hmm. And kids I didn't even know would come in to borrow those books. And I would say, well, if you go to the library, you can get the you know, you can get the hardback and that it prints better mm -hmm. and everything. No, we want this one. And mm -hmm. I, I think lots of times kids are shy about going to the library, at least they were back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I decided I was going to be a librarian. And I, I, so I took a year's leave of absence from Morristown High School. And I was finishing up, uh, well actually I'd done it two or three classes along the way, you know, just like reading classes and things. Mm -hmm. And so, but I had to do other things when I decided to really get, get serious about getting a master's degree. And so it must have been probably in December that I was in the office of the, the head of the library program there, or it was called the media program, mm -hmm. and Mrs. Johnson, who was the librarian in the Knox right. County schools library was there waiting to see the head of the program because she said we just started chatting and I was there to see her about something and Miss Johnson was there because one of her assistants was leaving because her husband had been transferred mm -hmm. and so we just started talking and she said you wouldn't be interested in this job would you and I said well yeah I might okay. <laughs> so she said well why don't you come over <clears throat> and talk to Mildred Patterson? She does the hiring. And she said, I'll tell her we want you. So that was how I got the job with the Knox County School. And when I started working I, in January of 59, yeah. Yeah, was it? Yeah, January 59. <clears throat> Why, uh, it was wonderful. It, I just loved it so. But at the end of that, year I had as a teacher I had done a lot of teaching of reading through library books and so we had a snow day about February and I couldn't get to work but I had brought on that night a book called Individualizing Your Reading Program by Jeanette Veach and she told all about how to use library books to teach reading and so I went back and I told Miss Johnson about it and I said we ought to be doing that through our library. So about that time, uh, it was about, oh, I guess April, and teachers started calling in and said they had finished their basal reader reading program and would they send them another set of basal readers and they would, you know, go ahead with some more work. And I said to Ms. Johnson, <clears throat> you know, maybe we ought to let some of these teachers try reading, teaching reading with library books. So she said, I said, would you let me go out and try it with two or three teachers? And she said, well, yeah, that's so. So I, accord, I did it according to Jeanette Veach, okay. <laughs> an individualizing your reading program. And there were, must have been about five or six that I did this way. And, and <clears throat> the word got around about it. And when school started in the fall, teachers started calling in and wanted to know if I couldn't come and help them teach reading with library books. Who else was in the central <clears throat> office? Okay, hang on. 
Okay. 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 Uh, so you came in as Miss Johnson's assistant. assistant. Right. And, and then that was January. And then very soon I said, I, teachers would just call in and say, would you send, send me 30 books? That they right. could get 30. That's of, what we could with, get yeah. per, mm -hmm. per classroom. And, and I would say, well, what are you studying now? Would you like to have some books to use with what you're studying? Oh, well, I hadn't thought about that. Well, yeah, well, we're studying Russia, you know. So I started putting things in like that. And and that's where I began to, people began to recognize that I probably could help them a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, as I say, when April came, why, then they, uh, one or two, I guess there were four or five of them who, who said, yeah, they'd like to try an individualized reading program. And so then, the, then Miss Dole found out about all this. You know, she knew what was going Everybody. on in the school. Oh, yeah. yeah, she really okay. did. And uh, so she said, "Well, Ruthie, that's what she called me. Ruthie, I think we ought to put you on the administrative staff and call you a materials consultant." Okay. Well, I thought that's pretty hot stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right. So, so then um, I, several teachers. Uh, asked me if I would would help them to do some of that. Well, I had I was I wasn't sure I wanted to go really countywide on this because you have to be a good organizer to right. to, to do Absolutely. you know, you know that. You know, there's certain things if you if, a lot of teachers really do need the basal reader and that guidebook That's that right. tells them when to turn the page. And, and I don't think they have any business getting out of that basal reader if they can't handle it otherwise. But anyway, when, when they started asking about that, I said, well, uh, I'll have a meeting with all the people who are interested in doing this, but now it's not easy, and you've got to prove to me that you can organize your classroom. And so I don't know whether I don't remember whether there were any teachers from Amherst who came or not. But there were there were more than there, a dozen. There really wasn't because yeah. uh, the teachers there um, didn't have degrees. Oh, that was yeah. those years. Yeah. And they were good basic teachers, mm -hmm. and that was true right across the county. Yeah. So they wouldn't yeah. have been involved. There wouldn't have been yeah. so there. Yeah. Well. I, I, I said, you know, we're going to have to meet together and talk over what we do. And, and that I would like to do something with for this. I haven't done anything for this, but I, somewhere in all my junk, <laughs> I have some, I had a slideshow that I worked out, but I think that I pulled some of those slides out and used them for something else. But I'm going to work on it. I do right. know that we, we ended up with 50 ways to sell books in the classroom, which is a printout that I can give you. I, okay. And I, I couldn't find it when I was looking for some things, but I know some teachers that I've given it to in classes that I had when I taught. So were you working probably, on your master's at the same time? Or no, I'd already finished my master's. Yeah, I did, I'd already <laughs> finished my master's when I came to Knox County. Okay. And then you... You got promoted again. Maybe, <laughs> well, <laughs> to, I did. Uh, I, yeah, I did that whole that that year. But I was still, you know, the li assistant librarian. Really, I, I worked more in the library right. than I did out in the schools. And uh, so, at the end of that year, Phyllis Coker, you remember her? I didn't remember Phyllis. Yeah. Well, she was a supervisor, and she wanted to go on leave to work on her doctorate. And so everybody would say, well, what do we do with that, Phyllis, you know? What we, it'll only be a year, so you can't hire somebody, you know, for just a year, and blah, blah, blah. So I think it was Willis Selby who said to Miss Stone, why don't you let Ruth Ellen do that? And so they went back and forth, and I think Maddie Campen wanted to do it. Do you remember Maddie Campen? Maddie just died. I, that's what somebody told me, yeah. I'm she sure. was in her 90s. It, well, I would, I would have said so, yeah. So anyway... Um, uh, Miss Doyle called me in one day, and she said, well, what do you think? She she would jokingly call Phyllis Coker, Phyllis. <laughs> okay. She would say, what do you, Ruth, Ruthie, what do you think about taking over Phyllis's job? I said, Miss Doyle, I don't want to be a snoopervisor. <laughs> and yeah. she said, I said, I'm not even qualified, you know, I'm not certified. Uh, I don't have a, a certification. Oh, we can take care of that, she said. Yeah. 
So I said, well, I, don't, I really like what I'm doing. And she said, well, but she said, what you are doing is what a good supervisor ought to do. So I said, well, okay. I, and, and I was trying also to work with the secondary English teachers. Uh, they were hard to work. I used to say I couldn't change my personality quick enough to go to a high school and an elementary school in the same day. That's right. Very different. Yeah, courses. very different. So, um, but I'd really gotten involved with that, and I'd already planned to go to the University of Chicago that summer to do this. They used to have this four-week workshop in reading that William S. Gray and, and Helen Robinson and all those big names in reading ran. And I, I had wanted to go ever since I got interested in teaching reading. So I said, well, I, I wanted to do this because I was working uh, 11 months. I was off uh, the month of July, and, and that was when they had this thing. So I said, there ought to be some kind of a handbook for these high school English teachers. They don't, you know, they don't really know what to do. So that's where I wrote this, and I told that here. And I, of course, I, I had more, I didn't, couldn't do all of it, because some of it I had to use books back here. <clears throat> but anyway, that was that. And also, I, um, during the, all ninth graders were supposed to read Julius Caesar. Well, those kids couldn't read Julius Caesar. <laughs> So I wrote Julius Caesar. <laughs> All right. So it's the story of women. I'd for, I, I didn't know I even had this. And Glenna, uh, Glenna Rice was one of our reading teachers, and she I did the Glenna. yeah she did the illustration. So there's this is this okay. all goes together. Okay. <clears throat> and then I so I agreed to you know take on that job. How and long I, were you? Were you I, just in the one year then? No, no. I I was. Uh, let's see. I've got it down here. I think it was five years. Yeah, it was five years. It, did Phyllis come back or? She came back. No, I, Phyllis didn't come back. She went to Chattanooga. Okay. But she she may have come that. back a year. I'm not sure. Yeah. But she went from here to Chattanooga. So were you an elementary supervisor? Well, I was the years? language arts reading Lang supervisor. Yeah. Language arts. At first, I was just um, part-time secondary English and then generally elementary. Well, you know, that, w that was too much. And mm -hmm. so Willa Selby was really a specialist in early childhood. I wasn't. I'd never taught first grade, mm -hmm. even though... Uh, I, I had done some work in first grade, you know, with my library work, but, and I didn't feel too good about that. So, anyway, we divided it up, and I became K through 12 reading language arts supervisor, and then Willa was early childhood supervisor, and wasn't there some, I guess Beecher was, yes. Beecher had come into the central right. office then. Yeah, he, he must, came in. And yeah, he must have worked with. He must have been in about 1960, yeah. 61. Yeah, I guess that's right. So, so anyway, the last year I was I was ju I just worked with reading language arts, but those other years I was. What well, one year we divided it so that Willa had certain um, areas in the county and I had certain areas. Yeah, that's the way it worked. Out. You know, every year they changed it. Absolutely. And you, and you just went on doing the same thing you right. always did. <laughs> That's about it, right? Just about, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, I guess um, after about six or seven years of that, I uh, decided that I didn't know enough to do the job. I needed to go on for an advanced degree. And by that time, I, had, I was so deeply into all this, I knew I was going to spend the rest of my life at it. So. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, I, I liked teaching more than I did supervising. And so I decided I would go on for an advanced degree. And the, I went that, I, I looked over University of Chicago that summer thinking I might go there, but I really didn't like it that much. And uh, Leland Jacobs, who was renowned in children's literature, came to uh, UT, University of Tennessee, that next summer to do a, uh, 
two-day conference in reading. You know, they used to have a, when Alberta right. Lowe was there, they oh, used yes. to have, yeah, they used to have two, three days it was. And so Leland Jacobs came, and also, um, about the time that I heard he was coming, I thought, oh, good, I'll go to that, and maybe I'll go to Teachers College, Columbia University for my doctorate. And I got an invitation from Teachers College, Columbia University, to come and participate in a two-week um, seminar for supervisors. And I still don't know how they got my name, but anyway, I went. But while Leland Jacobs was here, he was standing out in the hallway after one of his sessions, and Willa Selby and I were there uh, chatting in the, in the hallway, and I said, look over there at Dr. Jacobs. He doesn't look as though anybody's taking care of him. I said, let's go over and invite him to go out to dinner today. <laughs> so Willa said, oh, do you think he would? I said, well, we won't know if we don't ask him. <laughs> so, we went over. Sure enough, he was tickled to death. So we took him up to Wallen. Back, what was that? They used to have that wonderful restaurant up there that had the best country ham. Do you remember the name of it? I remember, but I can't think yeah. of the name of it. Anyway, I told him that I'd gotten this invitation to go to the seminar up there, and I said, well, tell me about it. Oh, well, he said, that's wonderful. You ought to do that. He said, it's a good way to get acquainted with all the different things that Teachers College has to offer. He said, I'll be doing a lecture. Every, practically everybody on the staff will do a lecture in their field. And so you should come and get acquainted. And I said, well, I've been thinking about starting a doctorate. Oh, well, he said, come in and talk to me while you're up there, and I'll be glad to talk with you about it. So I did. Well, Leland Jacobs couldn't he could sell refrigerators in Iceland. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, <laughs> I said to him, Do you, I'm not sure I want to pursue this. And he said, well, he said, I, I said, I w I've been to Peabody. I went over there to a couple mm -hmm. of sessions. And I went to the University of Chicago, and I said, I, I'm conscientious about my job, but I don't know whether I want to spend... I mean, that's hard, hard work. Mm -hmm. Well, he, he's a big old fat guy. Did you, ha you didn't happen to go to that <coughs> thing. But I remember him from somewhere, yeah. so I, maybe I was there. Well, he, he, he reared back and he's big wide lips and a big fat guy. And he said, well, I'll tell you, anywhere you go to get a doctor's degree, you have to jump through a lot of hoops. But he says, here at TC, we don't pinch your bottom when you jump. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. I said, well, sounds okay to me. <laughs> so I said, count me in. So I came back and, and taught that, I mean, worked that next year. And I went then up, uh, uh, well, I went to that summer uh, seminar too. Mm -hmm. And that really sold me because I met all these different people that I knew I'd be working with. So I, I, that's how I happened to get my doctors to be. And while I was at this, at this time, uh, the big buzzword in reading and language arts was linguistics. Okay. Remember how everybody oh, yeah. went crazy over linguistics. So um, I, I, thought, I, I, I thought, well, I ought to find out more about this. So I got, went over to the uh, English department and got into a class in, in linguistics taught by Robert Allen. Well, I just practically swooned every night <laughs> because I had taught I had taught grammar of course in the sixth grade, and then when I went to high school, I got some of those same kids in my ninth grade English classes, mm -hmm. and the ones who learned grammar in the sixth grade still knew it, but the ones who didn't still didn't know it. <laughs> right. And I hated teaching grammar, and the way he described it. I said, I just, it makes so much sense to me, and I would like to teach a class of kids uh, the way you teach. Well, of course, everybody in the class says, that southern lady is just, she's just pulling her, <laughs> her southernness on that professor, because everybody was utterly confused, because he had a whole different way of looking at how you teach grammar. It was mostly to listen to how kids talk and how they use their language and to take that and help them to see 
how their language is put together, the whole structure of language, rather than teaching them the parts of speech and how to diagram a sentence and all that sort of thing. Well, I just thought I've got to teach this to some kids. So when, before I left, I was there a full year, and, uh, and I had finished all my coursework by that time, except three classes I think I still had to take. And then, of course, I had, of course, I had to do the dissertation. So I went in and talked to Dr. Allen, and I said, I would like, I'm a supervisor in a county school system. I think I could get some teachers to work with me to test your, your linguistic approach. How, what do you think about that? Well, he just had a fit. He thought it'd be wonderful. <laughs> so I came back and told Ms. Doyle, and I wrote up my proposal. When I went up to present my proposal, Mildred Doyle and Mildred Patterson and Katherine Johnson took me up there. <laughs> it was it was the um, it was the uh, World Series, and Miss Doyle wanted to go to the World Series, and then Patterson always liked to go to the theater up there, mm -hmm. and then uh, Miss Johnson just she just would do anything. I mean, she's very congenial. So we had the best time, and while they had they played, while I I had my oral for from my qualifying exams, and I presented my proposal after I'd talked with Ms. Doyle about it, got permission, and I had uh, uh, announced to do some, I wanted to do it with fifth graders, and I, I, get, I don't know how I got 12 fifth grade teachers to volunteer to work with me, and I developed, uh, Dr. Allen already had a, quite a few materials, and that's, a lot of this came from him, but this is it. <laughs> okay. And it's it's the key. And That's then right. when it was we did we started it in um, October, and um, uh, we we finished what he had done and what I had a lot a lot of this I did too. Mm -hmm. And then uh, some of the teachers said, well, we still have another month, and we finished all your materials. So I did a little bit more here. So mm -hmm. this was not, I didn't collect data from this, but this was a kind of a review and a continuation of it. So, so you welcome. used that for your I dissertation? Use that, I used that for teaching the teachers how to teach the fifth grade kids. All right. I, I went at 8 o'clock three days a week over to Vestal School and taught a fifth grade myself. And then I, I uh, met with the teachers and taught them what I taught. I didn't teach them until I'd taught the kids, so I knew how my kids responded. And right. I figured I took I picked Vestal because I knew Miss Doyle was, was partial to Vestal. <laughs> right. That plus I thought I'd get a, a more of a heterogeneous group because like if I'd gone to you know some other uh, one of the bigger schools like Farragut or something, why well, you wouldn't have had as as many different levels. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, that's and then this is my dissertation. Okay. This was the data that I did. Okay. Dr. Great. Allen would not let me include this because he wanted to get it published, mm -hmm. and and so he said if you get it copyrighted through your dissertation, you can't copyright it on your own. And so that's why it's not in there. I think it. I think it's too bad because people reading the dissertation would wonder, you know, what I did. I describe it, but it's not. I don't have the lessons, and I haven't written anything to go with this because I don't. I figure anybody's interested enough to know about it, it'll just thumb through the dissertation. But if you think I need to do something with it, I will. You can look it up. Okay. And so that's how I got my doctor's degree. And when did you leave Knox County? I've lost track of that. Okay, I left Knox County. Uh, I finished this in, in the spring of 65. And I came back and I told them that I was, well, while I was, when I was finishing at, teach, at Teachers College, the head of the department, Alice Mile, you probably heard of her, right? she called me in and said that the University of Florida was looking for people in reading. And would I be interested in going there to teach? And I said, no, I, I like what I'm doing. I want to go back to do what I'm doing. So uh, when I came back 
then that year. Or I guess, well, I don't know exactly how all this worked out. But I remember going to a, uh, while I was at Teachers College that first summer for that seminar, I met um, Muriel Crosby. She had been president of NCTE and also ASCD. And she was president of ASCD while, while I, when I met her. And so she, while I was at that seminar, I had to give a presentation of something that I had done in the way of supervision. That if you got credit for that seminar, you had to do something. A lot of the people who were in that seminar were people who already had their doctor's degrees. Mm -hmm. I was really a little old puny something. <laughs> there were about eight or ten of us, I guess, who were young and enthusiastic, and but most of them were, you know, from other big school right. systems or the state department or whatever. So anyway, I did a presentation on how you do an individualized reading program. I wowed them. <laughs> I can believe that. And you know, I, we, we, the 12 of us who had to do some presentation um, drew lots and part of us uh, presented at the dinner that closed the session. Mm -hmm. And the other part did them the next morning where they came back to then totally close. Well, I drew a lot to do it at the dinner. Well, they were also typed up. I mean, they would have laughed at anything. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. And it was then that Alice Mile came to me and said, you should come here and get a doctor's degree. <laughs> so, when right. I, so when I went up, I already had my foot in the door. <laughs> okay. yeah. But uh, that's not to say, though, that I didn't meet lots of challenges. I can believe that. And, but anyway, I, I made it. And so I told her I wasn't interested. But, but this Muriel Crosby was um, responsible for a session uh, at the National Elementary Principals Conference. Did you ever go to that? I was scheduled to be on the program the year I went to South Africa. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Well, I was on the program. And um, I did my individualized reading thing. Right. And there was a lady, a supervisor from... Um, North Carolina, forgotten where in North Carolina, but a big system, Mecklenburg, I think, or something. Anyway, she came up and said, uh, I wanted to get acquainted with me, and said that her best friend was the head of the depart elementary ed department at the University of Florida, and she was looking for somebody in reading. Wouldn't I like to go down there? And I said, no, I've already told Alice Mile I'm not interested in that. And so I was back on the job then. I just went, you know, for that conference. And, but I got a call about two weeks after that from the head of the department down at the University of Florida saying that her friend had heard me speak at the National Elementary Principals Conference. And wouldn't I be interested in coming down there to teach? And I said, I don't think so. But at that time, and you'll remember this, federal funds were coming in. And I was ending up having to write grant proposals. Mm -hmm. instead of going out and working with the teachers. And I was not liking that at all. And then I knew the next year we were supposed to adopt reading, basal reading materials. And already they'd been saying, well, Ruthie, <laughs> you, you'll be responsible for that. And, you, and I knew right then I was not going to be working with teachers. I was going to be sitting in my office working at the desk. Right. And so my job was not as, in, not as, to me, as challenging or as inviting, I guess, mm -hmm. as it had been. And so I said to Dr. Hilliard, who had called me, I said, well, I'll tell you, my parents and I are coming down to St. Petersburg week after next on spring break. And I said, how about if I just stop and let's look each other over? Well, she said, that's fair enough. Well, really, the reason I wanted to go is that Kimball Wiles was the dean. And Kimball Wiles' book on supervision had saved the day for me when I took that job. And I thought, and I had heard him speak at ASCD, and I thought, I'll get to meet Kimball Wiles. And the other person I wanted to meet was Evelyn Wenzel. She uh, taught children's literature. At, at uh, Florida, but I particularly wanted to meet Kimball Wiles. 
So I thought, well, this is a good way to get to meet them. Right. <laughs> so Mom and Dad and I went trucking down there to, to St. Pete. We stopped and spent the night in, um, in uh, Gainesville. And on Good Friday, I interviewed for this job. And I met, I met uh, gosh, I met all of them. <laughs> uh, the other one that was really uh, well known was Art Combs. He was president of ASCD one year. And another one was Bill Alexander. He was president. That, that college had more ex-presidents of ASCD of any other university, even TC. Did you ever meet Mike, Mike Nunnery? There? Oh, yeah. You know, he was my major professor. Oh, really? On my no. master's degree. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. He was superb. Oh, yeah. We were glad to get him. He superb. came, let's see, he came, well, in fact, I interviewed him for the job when he came down. And um, he, he came about three years, I guess, after I came down there. He's still mm -hmm. there. He's I had a lot of trying. health problems, but... I really should contact him. Oh, well, listen, when I go down, I'll call him and tell him okay. that I've seen you. I will, yeah. 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 Well, my name was Benny Davis, just like well, you said. Well, I know. Yeah, I couldn't remember. <laughs> I had it written down, but I couldn't pronounce it. Miss Doyle never called me anything else yeah. besides Benny Davis. Yeah. Uh, well, the full name. Like well, when I, when I called her, are you the one who answered? Yes. Right. Yeah. I said Benny David, and I thought, well, that's not really her name now. <laughs> but he knew who yeah. he he knew who I meant. So how long were you at the University of Florida? Twenty five and a half years. Wow. Okay. Yeah. But it, that, that interview with Kimball Wiles was something. His wife, his he was killed a year and a half after I went there. It was a real sad thing. He was killed in an automobile accident. Yeah. But his wife and I, his wife is now ninety three years old, and I just talked to her on the phone the day before yesterday. She mm -hmm. calls me about every other week. <laughs> We're good friends, but but um, that interview was something else. He was. Did you ever see him? I don't think he so. He was a wonderful speaker, and you just felt as though he was talking directly to you. Mm -hmm. And so I. But I remember going in and saying, "I don't know if I." even shouldn't tell her. We, we're still talking. Are you taking my picture while we're doing yeah, it? Right. Oh, heavens. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I sauntered in there, you know. I really, I didn't have any intention of taking that job. I just wanted to see what they were doing. And so, so I sat down and he said, well, I understand you, are, you want to teach at the University of Florida. And I said, well, yeah, maybe. And he said, <laughs> He said, well, I said, I really just stopped for us to look each other over. I said, I was coming down anyway, and he'll, uh, Pauline Hilliard called me. I said, I, I actually, I'm very happy in my job that I have now, but, but I said, someday I want to go into college teaching, and maybe this is the time. I don't know. And he said, well, you know, the job is open in uh, September. Well, see, I was working on my dissertation still. And I knew I couldn't get it written by that time. And so I said, well, I wouldn't be available until January because I don't want to take a new job when I still have that dissertation to write. Oh, he said, you could come on down and write it. And I said, look, my sister went through that. I'm not, I'm not taking another job until I get that thing finished. And uh, he said, well, why would you want to come to the University of Florida? And I said, well, I've read your book on supervision. And if you operate like that book sounds, I said, I have an equal amount of experience with elementary and secondary. And I think the biggest problem in education is that elementary and secondary teachers never talk to each other. And according to your book, you say that they ought to work together. And I said, if you operate that way here, this is probably the only college of education that I'd even be interested in. Well, he, I was sitting there, he was sitting in his bed. He leaned over and took my over. He says, lady, you can come here anytime you want to. <laughs> and, <laughs> that just floored me. I didn't know what to do. You know, I thought to myself when I got out of there, what in the, you are crazy. <laughs> what in the world? Yeah. But, but uh, I was honest, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't just fooling around. I, I was serious. So anyway. Well, let, I let me job. ask you this. Now, you just had the one sister. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, she's six years older than I am. And what did she pursue? I should know, but I don't. She's a violinist. 
That's right. Yeah, she was That's music. Right. She got her master's degree at Eastland School of Music and her doctorate at Florida State in music ed. Okay. And she taught at Eastland School of Music after that, uh, about eight years, I think. But she it was too cold. Okay. <laughs> she couldn't take the she couldn't take the winters. <laughs> so anyway. But what have you done since you retired? Well, since I retired, I say here, currently Dr. Cruz enjoys gardening and exploring the mountains in Tennessee in the summer and doing volunteer work and beachcombing in Florida the rest of the year when she's not traveling elsewhere. Okay. Uh, now you notice I wrote that June nineteenth June 008. Right. My whole, the last, you can turn that off because we're out of my profession. <laughs> okay, stop it because I yeah. wonder if it. Okay. Uh, he's good at fixing it. I can things. edit it out later. Yeah, I well. Swear. But well, what, I, what happened is that I, um, I. Your battery's still okay? Oh, yeah. I'm, I met Mildred Dahl when I came in to be interviewed for the job that I'd already <laughs> already accepted. Right. <clears throat> and she, we just clicked right away. But then that was the way Miss Dahl was. She was a very outgoing, very friendly, kind, thoughtful person. And uh, I would see her in the in the building. She'd come down to the library every once in a while. And when she found out that I was telling teachers that they ought to get some books that had to do with their curriculum, <laughs> she, I don't know where she found out about that. She said, Ruthie, how would you like to go out and visit a school with me? I said, I'd just love to, Miss Doyle, if Miss Johnson thinks it's okay. Oh, Miss Johnson, of course, said it was okay. Miss Johnson was wonderful to work with and for. I she know. really was a fantastic person. And so I... <laughs> Went out with Miss Doyle to class to a school. I don't remember which one. It, it might have been Vestal. I'm not sure because she liked to go to Vestal. But I'll never forget how the kids just oh they got so excited. Miss Doyle was here, <laughs> and she we went in a classroom and one of the boys came up and <coughs> whispered something in her ear, and she grinned and she said, "Well, yes, I think I can do that," and she raised her arm. And he came over and brought a baseball and handed it to her. It might have been a softball. I think it was softball. She raised her arm up, and somehow or other, the way she moved that ball, it made it look as though she had a huge muscle in her arm. <laughs> and then when she lowered her arm, you know, it, it, there was no muscle there at all. <laughs> Oh, everybody loved it. All the kids just clapped, you know. And we got out of there, and I said, you're a real show-off, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. She just laughed. Oh, those brown eyes would just dance. And so when we got back uh, to the office, I said, Miss Stoll, anytime you want me to go with you out to a school, I'd love it. <laughs> she said, well, we ought to get you out into the schools more. And so I, you know, I liked that idea, idea too. But but I was pretty busy back back at the office. Uh, but I remember that that one particular time. And then I remember one time going to lunch with her. And and um, I said, you know, Miss Doll, I have heard that when you were born, your father took you out on the front porch, and he pointed you toward the co county courthouse, and he said, Mildred. There is your life. You remember that when you become an adult. I said, did he really do that? And those, those brown eyes just danced, and she said, I've heard that too. <laughs> <laughs> but she was always coming up with something. And thinking back, you know, I don't know how I could have been so bold as to ask her some of the questions I asked her about her life. But she was wonderful. <laughs> but I remember going into her office one day, and I don't remember what it was all about because I, I rarely went into her office, but I went in, sat down. Well, usually if I wanted to do something and I thought I needed her permission to do it, I would go in. But I'd always have it worked out, and she would look at me, and she, or maybe I'd have it written down, she'd look at it, and she would say, well, that sounds like a good thing to do. How much is it going to cost? <laughs> 
And if it doesn't cost anything, go right ahead. Right, yeah, yeah. And I always laugh, we'd laugh and say when I'd come out and say, well, Miss Doyle, let me do that if it doesn't cost anything. But I remember when I, when I got so concerned about the high school English teachers who were teaching GE English, and they had no materials, they hadn't been trained to do that sort of thing. And I said, Miss Doyle, I'll have to have some money if I do what I want to do with them. Well, how much do you want? And I said, well, let me work it out, and I'll just give you a bill for it. Fine, fine. And I think I got $500. I don't remember exactly, but it wasn't any big atrocious amount. But she said, that sounds like you know, a good thing. So we ordered books with it, and I, I don't, she, I, she, she got that published. You know, they, they printed that in the office. But, but <clears throat> the time I went in to talk with her, though, when she op was opening her mail, and she would open her mail and listen, you know, but she'd look and see and she'd put in a pile and listen mm -hmm. in the pile. And then she opened this letter and she just laughed. And she said, I can't believe this. They kicked me out. <laughs> I said, what's that, Miss Doll? Maryville College wants to give me an honorary doctor's degree. <laughs> and she says, and they kicked me out. <laughs> and I said, well, what in the world did you do to get kicked out? She thought a few minutes, well, she said, there were quite a number of things that I did that they could have kicked me out for. But she said, I think the straw that broke the camel's back was when I put Vaseline on the doorknobs over in Anderson Hall. <laughs> that was the admin building. That, that was the administration building, yeah. yeah. So, but I'm, I'm sure that probably uh, that minister, who did I tell you that was? Copeland. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Copeland. Copeland. He was president then, yeah. Mm -hmm. And a good Presbyterian. Oh, yeah, good Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I remember uh, when we went, uh, when they went with me, uh, or I went with them up to New York for me to present my dissertation proposal and to have the oral on my, my uh, quals. The, she, when we were coming home, she says, Ruthie, wouldn't you like to drive a big Cadillac. I said, Miss Doyle, I'd be afraid to drive a big Cadillac after driving a Chevrolet for all these years. Yeah. <laughs> oh, come on, she said, give it a try. So I did, and I'll tell you, I almost bought one when I one time thought yeah. I might have enough money to pay for one. <laughs> uh, but, I drove uh, the Cadillac Miss Doyle had, uh, Miss Patterson, for Miss Patterson. Oh, she really? had, I think Miss Patterson had, she had a big something, could have been a Buick. Yeah, but it was enormous. What, yeah. And yeah. I. Yeah. But they're yeah. wonderful. Yeah. I remember the last. The, I drove Oldsmobiles for a long time, and when I went in to get one, why well, the guy that I bought all of them from <clears throat> said to me, "I think you ought to buy a Cadillac." He said, "I think you can afford a Cadillac." I said, "Well, maybe I can afford it, but I don't want. <laughs> I don't want to create an image of one who can afford it." <laughs> But it, it was a nice car. Uh, and I know several times I went to lunch with her, and of course everybody always swarmed around her. And uh, some of them, they'd walk away and she'd make some <laughs> crack about them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Most of them were politicians, you know. But she could hold her own with, with any of them. They, and they respected her, too. Now, we've tried to recall some of her favorite stories she told. Oh, yeah. Mm. I don't know whether you remember any of them. I really don't. I might, if I think of any, I'll give you a call. Yeah. Well, since this isn't going to be on the tape, I'll tell you the one that just cracked me up. Okay. Let's see if I can. She and Beecher were walking from the, you know, the Hills, Hill Avenue up to the courthouse. Yeah. And uh, they passed a man that was the representative down in Nashville. I guess he's in the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. And he stopped and said, Mr. Doyle, I appreciate your support. I really do. I won't forget that. And I'll be winning. And Beecher said, Mr. Doyle, are, are you supporting that man? And she said, well, Beecher, I am. And she said, he, Beecher said, Miss Doyle, you know he is one sorry son of a bitch. And she said, 
well featured. I do know that. But he's our son of a bitch. <laughs> Well, that, that makes sense, yeah. yeah. And the other one, I can't tell them like she told them, but oh, uh, yeah. and Beecher told me about, uh, again, somewhere they had bumped into a, another politician yeah. on the street. Of course, everybody knew her. Oh, yeah. And uh, they were talking, walked on, and she said, Beecher, I'll tell you something. He is one GD, prismatic son of a bitch. <laughs> And Beecher said, well, Miss Doyle, I understand the GD, and I understand the son of a bitch, but what do you mean, prismatic? She said, Beecher, he's the son of a bitch in any way you look at him. <laughs> well, I remember having lunch with her one day. I think I told you this when we were together the last time. Yes. Uh, we were over at, um, over at the Regus, and Max Friedman came over okay. and patted her on the shoulders, you know, and carried on over. And she carried on with him too. <clears throat> and he, <clears throat> excuse me, he walked away and she's goddamn son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. She's notorious for it. Yeah. I said, Miss Doll, how can you how can you be that way? And she says, What do you mean, Ruthie? <laughs> I said, Well my gosh, anybody seeing you would think you were first cousins or something. Well, that would even make him a bigger son of a bitch, she said. <laughs> Oh, no, she she was she was a politician. Oh, she and a was. Good one. She was. She and was. And she just had a wicked sense of humor. Oh, she did. Uh, she said every time uh, that she saw Fred Berry, that yeah. he couldn't fool her. That oh. he was measuring her up for a coffin every time he looked at her. <laughs> <Gosh>. <laughs> you know? yeah. Oh my lord. Yeah, mm. and of course the story was told about uh, Miss Patterson was trying to get her, you know, that, that they should make whatever arrangements that they wanted for their mm -hmm. own funeral. Yeah. And Miss Doyle, mm -hmm. they, they got to the, to the songs, and they weren't the hymns. I, I, somewhere I've got it written down. But one of the ones, Miss Doyle said, uh, Miss Patterson said, now, Miss Doyle, what do you want sung last? And she said, well, I'll tell you, Patterson, what I'd really like. And Patterson said, well, you tell me and we'll do it. You know what she chose? Take me out to the ball game. <laughs> Did they do it? No. Oh, I wish they I had would have. have. Oh, I, I would have. have. Yes, yeah. I would have. Miss Patterson you know, uh, Virginia Ralston, <laughs> Catherine had just come back to mm -hmm. Knoxville uh, when, when Miss Doyle had died, and Virginia Ralston was going to play, and she called Catherine. And Catherine is a perfectionist, and Virginia Ralston would just pick up her violin and play anywhere. <laughs> and so Catherine said, Virginia, I can't do that. The funeral's tomorrow, and we don't have time to rehearse. And, and so she didn't play. And I'm sorry she didn't, because I said, Catherine, if I'd been there, I would have said, go ahead and play, because Miss Doyle would have enjoyed it no matter how it sounded. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she, would, she would have. Did you see her? Many time before she Yeah, died. I was oh, there. Gosh. I can't see. I had breast cancer. and I didn't know that. Yeah, 20 years ago. Just celebrated my 20th. And You're the exception. Huh? You're oh, the I exception. know. I know. I tell my oncologist every time I go to see him. In fact, I went when I went down in January, I saw him and I said, Do you know it's my 20th anniversary coming to see you? And he said, I, It doesn't seem like it's been that long. I said, No, it doesn't. But I said, I thank you every day. <laughs> anyway, I, I, mother was so worried about me. She was still living then, and so I took the summer off. But I arranged to get my chemo uh, here. But I hadn't done it yet. I came for spring break, and, and Selby called me, and she said, I don't think Miss Doyle's going to be here long. She said, I think we should go see her. So I said, yeah, oh, I wouldn't have even known her. Mm -hmm. Oh, get her. Mm -hmm. She grabbed me and hugged me and kissed me. I mean, she, I, I just, she knew, she knew. But she's the one who told me who to get to do my chemo, Dr. Alan so Solomon, who is, um, he was with Baptist then, but he's with UT now. I saw him the other day, but I didn't remind him of it. And you know, Miss Patterson, this is just a lot like my grandmother. Oh, really? In the way she died, Miss oh. Patterson just got over, and yeah. her heart just gradually quit. Well, that's the way to do it. 
And uh, because Miss Dole, she, Doctor Sullivan told me he said she has gone through hell. Yeah. But he says she has been a. And she she's didn't been want a to good die. one. Miss hmm? Doyle did not want to die. Oh well, no, she didn't. wouldn't. No, she wouldn't want to die. She uh, would. She would fight to the bitter end. Were you know? here when she lost the election? No, I wasn't in. Well, let me tell you that she that just about worse. died. That was yeah. worse than her dying. I'm sure it was. I know. And I she was, never got over. No, I'm sure she did. See, they visited me in Florida a couple of times. They went, she and Miss Doyle and Miss and Ms. Johnson traveled together yeah, a lot exactly. after they retired. And they would go down to uh, Florida, uh, South Florida. Miss Doyle didn't like Florida, but Patterson did. Yeah. And so uh, they stopped by and had dinner at my, at my apartment uh, twice, I believe. But uh, she wouldn't talk about it much. Well, and she blamed everybody but herself. Really? She did. Well, I heard Willa told me a lot about it. It must have been real. Bad. It was awful. But it you know, awful. the year I was at, te at Teachers College was the year they had that election about merging. That It didn't pass. Consolidation. Yeah. It didn't pass that That's year. right. It didn't. I was but, principal out at Asbury. Yeah. Well, I, I want you, I got, Miss Dahl insisted I must get an absentee ballot vote. I went all over New York City trying to find a place where I could get home. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we got to go, haven't we? Yeah, we're going to run you out. Unfortunately, on Friday, we have to leave. Yeah. Well. Oh, I just love that. I have